So I wanted to tell everyone before we dive into the webinar that we do have the conference on adult uh, on adult learning and enrollment management, otherwise known as CALUM. And uh, registration is open for that. It is in Orlando. And Orlando is a wonderful place to be in late February when it's in most of the country cold and wet. It will be warm and hopefully very sunny. Um, I know some of our team members are planning on uh, coming to CALUM and going um, going a little early so they can bring their family. So I, I hope you will plan on coming to Kalem. We have some fantastic speakers lined up for it, so it should be a great conference. So to tell you a little bit about myself, I've been speaking now. Um, my name is Nicole Forschler, and I am Vice President of University Partnerships with Education Dynamics. I will be your fearless facilitator here, uh, but I will be turning over the wheel to Carol Eslanian, who is the President of Eslanian Market Research, which is a division of Education Dynamics. So we'll be with you today. Um, for those of you who may not be aware, Education Dynamics, who is the, who, we are the company who's presenting this today, um, provides solutions to universities across the country. Um, specifically, we work with departments who serve post-traditional students. And we provide market research services through, um, through Carol and her team, marketing services. We have a fantastic contact center in Boca that ensures that there's quick response and good guidance in supporting your prospective students. Um, we can wrap all of that together with enrollment and retention support, all with the goal to um, get more students into your programs. So specifically, when we're talking about um, Aslanian Market Research, and Carol, if you can go to the next slide, mm -hmm. um, Aslanian Market Research was founded by Carol Aslanian, and many of you know Carol Aslanian's name. She has been in the higher education industry for a, for just a little while because she's so young, but she's a legend. <laughs> You'd rather um, not say, Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> Carol's the author of Americans in Transition. Um, she started with the College Board and moved and then began the Islanian group in 2000 and in 2009 became part of our team at Education Dynamics. Um, she's, she and her team are constantly publishing. She's had eight major publications, 10 national studies, um, is actually about to, is actually in the process of launching a new one right now that you will all hear about. Uh, 90 professional development seminars and uh, many, many, many market studies for all types of institutions. So, Carol, at this point, I will be quiet and turn the reins <laughs> over to you. Very good. Thank you, uh, Nicole. Yes, I just want to put a footnote in there. We are designing another national study on the post-traditional market which will include both undergraduates and graduates as of 2020. And so that will be ready at our, I think, Nicole will, will present the findings and the report at our Calum conference, which would be a good reason to be there because it'll be a, an overwhelming report about what's happening uh, today. Okay. Well, as many of you know, I, I'd like to begin with looking at what's happening overall in higher education. Um, but footnote, what we're doing today in this presentation could be done for you and your institution alone if you like. I'm ready, willing, and able to do this uh, as I'm doing tomorrow for an upstate university. Um, the, the, these uh, findings that I'll share with you today, but also trying to relate them to your institution and to answer a whole host of questions you might have. In other words, a tailor-made version of what I'm going to begin sharing with you now if you're interested at all, and I have the contact information um, at the end of this presentation. I want to begin with telling you what's happening in this incredible landscape of higher education, which, of course, is changing right under our feet. Every time I visit a college, there's one question or another about enrollment, growth, international study, where are we going to get our students, and so on and so forth. So I want to give you a little preview of uh, what the data show. And, you know, the undergraduate and graduate enrollments, here it is, fall 1970 to 2017. Footnote, I guess our federal government can't do anything but give you accurate figures up to 2017. And when I have examined their projections over the years, as many of you have, their projections are always out of line. They're always higher than they eventually 
are. So I, I really want to start with 2017 and show you what's really happening because I think this pattern is continuing. We had a nice growth pattern until about 2010, 2011, and then we became relatively flat through 2017. My best guess is, uh, and I don't like to make projections, uh, but we're going to remain flat, if not slipping down a bit through the next uh, number of years. So this is a good, a good um, graph, I think, to share with your colleagues and your, your supervisors and administrators to say, you know, we have to move and we have to move fast. The next slide is um, the births by year. And I really like to relate the two. And if you can see, we've had a, a, a huge downfall in the number of births in the United States from 203 to 2017. And it doesn't look much more promising in the years ahead. I think the latest figure was that last year, 2018, was the lowest birth rate in 30 years. And we in higher education have to take this into consideration because those children born 18 years ago are our freshmen today and onward. And, and, and as the years move on, it, it seems as though the kinds of solutions we're trying to think of now will hold for a number of years given this pattern. And, of course, lower birth rate leads to lower higher high, high school graduation. It should be high school graduation numbers, okay? And um, you can see, you can, you can get WICHE data for each of your states, but this little incline in 2031 or 2028, we'll, we'll wait and see. What you should know now is for the very near future, uh, the lower high school graduation numbers. I was just at a university in, in, Ner in New Jersey and one in Connecticut, and the high school numbers look like uh, a, land, uh, a, a downslope on a, on a ski, skiing range. So it's, it's really moving down relatively fast, which, which really pr promotes that you all try to think of other ways to replace this declining number of high school students. And I think most of you in the audience I know and you will see that um, it's not only from the high school population, but some good news coming around about our post-traditional population. So, and here it is. Believe it or not, and we've checked this data over and over again, traditional students, and you need to share this with your colleagues, and those are students who study full-time day and in residence or nearby the campus, is really only 25% of the higher education enrollment, okay? And... They're full-time day in residence, and they are only 25%. So you can see your admissions people running around trying to compete with their neighbors and so on and so forth for a declining number of, of students for first-time college. This is not true in states like Florida, Texas, and California. But if you live in the Midwest or you live in New England, you certainly understand uh, what's happening there. However, the good news, and I think it's good news since many of you on the on uh, watching today are treating this population, are the 75% who are post-traditional students, any age, do not live on campus, and not necessarily full-time. Although you'll see they do study full-time when they package their courses over a course of a year in the right way, and I'll show you that shortly. But it's the 75% market that is the focus of our attention here at Aslanian Market Research and Education Dynamics. Another factor in increasing that post-traditional market, by the way, is that 60% of our undergraduate students do not finish in four years. Okay, we'll talk about them in a little while. And the latest figures I could get, and we check them all the time, is that 20% plus, I want to say, of all students today study fully online. Actually, it was 2017, it was 3.1 million, and today, I've gotten some figures that show, and I, I couldn't put them on because we, we got them late in the, in the morning, 20% of the graduates are online at four-year Publix, and 25% of graduate students are online at privates, okay? So if you ask for my prediction today, uh, or 2019 or 2020, we must be at least at 22, 23% of students study fully online. And that's why you're here today. So let's tell you a little about the methodology. This is the eighth year <laughs> that we've done this report. And you can go to our website anytime and get the four seven reports that we did hand in hand with um, uh, uh, learning. Oh, my goodness. My partner. 
Learning House. Okay, so our methodology has been the same for the last eight years. We go out to 1,500 respondents, and we use actually a national panel that we use for all our area market studies. We do this all for many colleges during the course of the year. We'll study their regional market to see what the market bears in terms of post-traditional students. But the 1,500 respondents are, are solid respondents. The margin of error you can see and the confidence level is quite good. So we feel good about these data and the sources. So we do have an online-based national research panel. And this is what you have to be able to say about yourself if you want to enter our survey on online students. You have to be fully online. This is not blended students. This is fully online studying for a degree, certificate, or licensing program. You have to have completed within the previous three years. Or you could be currently enrolled or have firm plans to enroll in the next year. And that is, you give us the name of the institution and the area of study. You have to be 18 years of age or older, and you have to have at least a high school diploma. So let's look at some key findings that are relevant to your work and to your ability to grow enrollments in the online realm for your institution. Uh, let's look first at generation. One third of the online market is one is is uh, first time first generation students. Most likely, I think this will increase, but of course, you know. It's dependent on immigration patterns and all kinds of entrances into our, into our country. So right now, one third of all post-traditional students are first generation. And I have a strong feeling that this might grow in the years ahead. It's, the, the population is also complex in that you have to remember that 87% of them have prior college experience. And you know why. I just shared the slide that said, uh, that they 60% of undergraduates don't finish in four years. What do they do? They go out and work, they get married, they have children, and then they come back when they know what they want and are willing to pay the cost. Many of them as sophomores or juniors of traditional age will say, why am I studying this topic? What am I going to get out of it? And will I ever remake this money I'm spending? Next one in three have been out of school for five plus years. You have to take that in consideration as you interview them and as you recruit them, as you think of their past history and experiences, they need a little bit of brushing up because it's been a while since they've been in a classroom or online. Let's look at some of the demographics here. The median income for these post-traditional students is $55,000, and we just got the data this morning that says in the United States, the median income is 60000 So your post-traditional students earn a bit less than the average American uh, in the United States, and that makes sense because they haven't fully finished their degrees, they're, they're working and studying at the same time, they're probably not doing as much full-time work as they want to, and so on and so forth. The next bit of information is, 64% of them are white, and that's slight. Uh, I don't have the percentages overall, but I will get that in, in our next presentation. 60% of them are female, and that's no news to you. Even among our traditional students, I think we're up to 55, 56% female. 60% have no children. Six, Nearly 60% are employed full-time. These are busy peer peel. They are working full-time, 60% of them, and they need your help in getting through those courses and their challenges uh, through study. 55% are single. And my block is right here. I think we're at 30% is first generation, and 31.8% is the average age. But I want to speak more about age because I think we have an incredible finding here. I want you to look at that. Well, let's look at the bottom row first. The average age of all online students is about 32. Among undergraduates, it's about 31. Among graduate students, it's about 34, just as you would expect those differences in undergrad and graduate. But look where I've had uh, a, a sort of circle that 39%. When I see commercials, and you, you've heard of one over and over again on television, talking about working adult populations, 
we've got to get rid of those terms and those labels. We're no longer dealing with the traditional adult student. 40% of the undergraduates are 18 to 24, okay? So the, I go a lot into this with, with schools that I'm working with about how should you be labeling these programs. Adult continuing professional education doesn't work anymore. Online education is for all people of all ages and of all backgrounds. We've got to stop linking it to our traditional adult only population. These are, and I think the data here quite clearly show that the age range means we're appealing to students of all type. And I think that younger population is going to get larger and larger, by the way, as the as they need to work and study at the same time and so on and so forth. So some very important data here in terms of age. The need for convenience is growing because nearly 60% are employed full time, 41% are parents, and 71% are enrolled full time uh, and spend at least 30 hours a week in classwork. Now, how do you how do you help them study full time? This is nothing they really want to do, but two two bits of data that we've collected in the past that aren't here because we know the answers, is they do want seven to eight week courses. They want back-to-back -back courses over the course of a year. They don't need their summers off. They don't need January and May to rest. They want to finish faster. So when they study on a full-time basis, that means it's back-to-back -back courses that you enable them to take, which qualify for full-time study. Very important they, they, that, that to them in terms of finishing as quickly as they can. What types of programs do they want? Well, it's called degree, 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 degree. We've been waiting for the certificate programs to grow from 14 and 20 percent, but not much change over the years. I know we all talk about certificates, and of course they're more popular at the graduate level than the undergraduate level. However, they remain fairly stable in terms of uh, enrollment. Are you a full-time student? 71%. And as I explained earlier, you institutions that are offering back-to-back -back seven to eight week courses over the course of the year are enabling to do that. Okay, it's not the traditional full enrollment. You've created the circumstances and the methods that allow them to study full-time while being married and working full-time. Programs of study. Also not too uh, newsy to you, but let's look at the undergraduate online students. Number one is business, and number one is business at graduate. But let me say a, a, a piece about the business graduate programs. As you know, the MBA uh, credential has been sort of lingering a bit. And what many institutions are doing now is learning that many of these AB, MBA students want specializations. They want to study nonprofit management or entrepreneurship. So what many of you institutions are doing are not just saying it's an MBA for an MBA and an MBA, which I can hand over to the employer across the table. No, I have an MBA in a specialization called X, Y, or Z. And I think that's what's keeping the business domain as high as it is. Uh, and that why we were having concerns about the MBA, but now with the specialization routing, I think that's, that's changed. Number two, computers and IT, of course. And number three, health and medicine. And you can learn the, the rest on your own. Uh, arts and Humanities seems to be quite popular among the undergraduates. That's because many of them are studying at the Arts and Humanities arena to specialize later as they enter graduate school. Um, so on. Influence of, uh, influence of, let's see, let me go back one second. Influence of financial incentives. I have a good one here for you to think about seriously. And that is, uh, yes, textbooks would make a nice difference, they say. Uh, which of the following would impact your decision to choose one online program or a number? Of course, test for giving them free textbooks. But look at number two, $500 annual scholarship. Now, we think that's nothing, really. When you think of your, your graduate programs and what they cost in actual dollars, you'll say, what's $500? But on each and every survey, and we did, we've done about 25 different surveys this year for individual colleges. That scholarship figure with their particular service group and region is very important. And we've tried to figure it out. And through some interviews, we learned that it's nice to go home and say, look, that institution is giving me a scholarship. How nice. Or on your website to announce the fact that you're giving away money. No matter what the cost is, it's still a compliment. It's something you can share with your friends and family that 
they must merely want me. And then moving down, you can see what these other incentives are. And they're important for you to realize because you're in a highly competitive market. So whatever you can do to, um, to entice them by these, by these gifts is, is very important. Okay. Number of schools considered. How many schools did you contact or request information from? The, for all students, the average is 2.5. What does that mean to you? And it's not so different with the undergraduate, 2.4, okay? So on average, these online students look at or consider two and a half schools, let's say two or three. That is, you've got to reach out with them as soon as possible because you've got a really good chance of uh, recruiting them to your institution because there's not a great deal of competition. But if you wait around and take days or weeks, I'm, I'm talking about within a day getting back to them, by the way, if you take days or weeks, you're gonna lose them to that other institution or that third institution. You've got a good ratio here for success, but you've got to act quickly. Okay. All right. I, I will. Nicole, I'll, it's over I'll you jump for in poll. here. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. I love this question. So we're going to take a poll, and, and of your existing students, we wanted to find out what percentage do you believe live within 100 miles of your institution? Um, and I think this is, this is a fantastic poll, especially because we get quite a lot of questions and uh, requests for, um, for marketing that's, that's beyond your front door, that's you know, one or two states over, or, or perhaps nationally, because we've seen uh, universities like Southern New Hampshire competing nationally. So the question of, is, is that reasonable? Should we, be, should we be reaching beyond 100 miles came up and was something that um, Carol and her team looked at. So it looks like I'll give everybody one more minute to cast their vote. Not really a minute, but more like 10 seconds. 10 more seconds to cast your vote. And I think you are all going to be very surprised. Hold on, it's still moving. So we're up to 79% of our, of our uh, student, uh, attendees have voted. Okay. All right, five, four, three, two, one. I'm closing it. Uh, let me share the results. So. This is where people believe that most of their existing students um, live. So uh, greater than 75% live within 100 miles, between 51 and 75%. People think live within 100 miles, between 26 and 50%, and less than 26. So uh, excellent, excellent answers to the question of what percentage live within 100 miles of you. I'll go ahead and hide that poll, and Carol, I'll let you take over with, the, with the real okay. answers. <laughs> well, the interesting thing, uh, Nicole, if that did not come out the way it did, then I wouldn't be able to explain these results. <laughs> and you're also right. In our 2019 survey, um, what, at 67, 77% of fully online learners lived within 100 miles of the institution in which they reside, okay? Now, when you, why is that true? Number one, they like to study closer than farther away because their employers know who you are, their family knows who you are, they may have gone to your institution anyway and you have local visibility. And if they needed any services, they could get over to your place as quickly as they can. So what does this mean, however? That's an advantage. The disadvantage is you've got competition all around you in your own backyard. So you're not competing with the Purdue's or the Phoenix's for most likely or the Arizona's, you're competing with your neighbors. So the more you know about what your neighbors are offering at what time and at what price with what incentives, the more likely you are to draw them to your place and not someplace else, okay? So more, in, and the problem was, uh, I know 10 years ago when one of the biggest uh, providers of online instruction could claim 350,000 students online. Today, 
far, far less. Why? Because in the 10 year span, I've seen college after college after college after college turning to online instruction. And you've taken away from the large scale providers because of your nearness. And some of these other things that we're, we're talking about and about these little incentives like scholarships and so forth. So distance does make a matter. But the more important thing to get out of this is your competition is in your own backyard. Mobile, mobile, mobile. I once had the Google uh, head speak at one of our conferences about online education. And she got up on the stage and she said three words, mobile, mobile, mobile. What else do you all want to know? <laughs> so she was absolutely right. And uh, this is for coursework. We asked for search. Do they search for colleges uh, mobile? I didn't even present the data because it's overwhelmingly, of course. But even here, many, many more want to study their take their courses uh, on mobile devices. We were with an institution in Connecticut recently, which is a great commuter location for New York City and so forth. And I think of all the people on buses and trains from New York City to this location, and we say, of course, your students who are traveling in nearby uh, locations would love to be online through their mobile device. So look at the results here. Uh, and, and, and try to enable your online students to, to study for their coursework wherever they are. Okay, moving on. Affordability, quality, and convenience. No news to you guys, I think. Um, these are ways in which your school can compete with the other locals, which you have to reach out and compete with, as we just showed. Um, are you affordable? Well, you know, we have a lot of private institutions that can't be affordable when compared to the public, but what are you going to give back? Number two, your reputation. Number three, we give you a, a quick pathway to your degree. Do you think the online learner likes to hear how quickly they can get that degree? Of course they do. And uh, you can take both online and on campus. That's another advantage. And you're in proximity to where they live. So these are the things I think what we have here actually is what you should be promoting through your marketing uh, service, through your marketing skills and, and procedures and whatever you contract out for in terms of marketing. These are the things you should be looking to announce and promote. Next, um, influence by third party resources in terms of selecting a school. Well, the three big ones, yeah, there are online reviews. Your reviews are very important. The search and ranking websites, you see them right there, and recommendations from friends or family. That's why that proximity issue is so important, because your friends and family are nearby. Do they know this school? Have they been there? And so on and so forth. College fairs, no. Community college, I tend no. All the rest. Direct mail, look, down to 12%. Emails, down to 11%. I think this, this conveys this story quite well about what you should be doing to, to influence potential students, prospective students. And the list goes on and on, and it's lower and lower. OK, quick decisions. How long did it take you from the time you first selected your, your college, your search for an online program, to completing it, your first application? Look at this, guys. In 2019, 25% did it in less than two weeks. I'm just looking at the 2019 figures right now. So if we look in less in four weeks or less, it's 60 percent. So uh, do you think you have to be pretty quick in getting back to them? And how about accepting them very quickly? And most important, which is not here, but I know from other studies, they need their financial aid information ready and quick. And they can't make their decisions without their financial information. That's what they keep telling us. So two to four weeks is 60 percent of the population. That's what it takes them. Uh, to completing their application. Okay. Uh, acceptance of credit is critical. Remember how many have been to college before? They bring to you at the undergraduate level. Uh, graduate students don't often bring credit. So I'm we looked at the data only at the undergraduate level. And on average, they bring back 30 credits. And that means time and money. When they see, when they hand over to you 30 credits, they want the time back and they want the money back, okay? So you have to be very, very gentle and cordial and accepting of these prior credits. Now, here is something that surprised even me this year and last year is the career services. I thought, well, these seasoned people who are married, working full time, been in, been in a career for a while. Why do they want to come back and work with a career advisor? 
Well, if you have children like I do and they change careers every three or four years and that's the pattern now and I keep saying, oh my goodness, that's not going to be good on your resume. And they say, no mom, that, that's out of date. And of course it is. I got to hear with my own uh, data. They keep moving around. They want to find the best uh, opportunity for that next year or two or three. And so what you can do and what you haven't been doing in online programs is offering career services. And that could make you stand out from the crowd, by the way. You could offer career advisors, a job search website maintained by the school, and self-assessments. What a nice addition to your online um, programs and one that could help you beat out the competition. And you can go down the line and see what's right for you, but I think those top three say it all. Support services, um, if you have to do support services, and I think what you should be doing, um, study skills development, remember they've been out for about five years. They may need that. You should have it as an option that comes out loud and clear. Time management and money management. What can you do? And, oh, I want to include health wellness assistance and mental health. Look at that. What are you doing now to say to your online students, we can help you with these things? because that can make you stand out from the crowd and do better than your nearby competitors. And that, those percentages are pretty good when you look at would use it if offered and used. Are you doing any of these things? If not, begin considering them, and that will help you stand out in the marketplace. And now we're ready for another poll, Nicole. <laughs> we're actually going to go through a couple of polls really quickly. So let's start with the first poll. The first poll is we want to know which which of the following data points are you collecting about your students? And this is a multi, uh, a multi answer. So you can absolutely um, let us know if you collect all of these, that's fantastic. Um, but if you collect one or two, that is great as well. So we'll give everybody a minute to let us know um, where what data are you collecting? And hopefully you're storing this in a thoughtful location. Um, of course, your application is a great place to have that. Um, but you may be collecting some of this information while you're talking to students and their prospects for your program. And that can also become compelling data points for your marketing. OK, I'm just going to give this one a couple more seconds, five, four, three, Two, one, I'm cutting you off and let me share the results. So um, almost everyone is, and it could be that everyone is, <laughs> um, collecting where people live, which makes a ton of sense. Um, the age of your student. I love. I love that um, so many of our so many of our attendees have uh, why they want a degree and. Um, and why they chose the university. So that's that's fantastic. So I'm going to launch one other poll for you, and that is, what piece of information would you find most useful that you aren't gathering right now? And while people answer that that poll question, um, we have uh, Carol. We've got the we've got we've got a couple questions being asked. Oh, um, good. Someone is asking, on the stats about online enrollment, 18 to 24, that's enrolled, what's the completion rate for that demographic? Yeah. And I don't know if that's something that no. you have an answer to. Yeah, we don't have All that. Right. We don't have that. Um, you know what, though? Um, when we do our next survey, when they are 18 to 24, we could ask where they are in, the, you know, in their studies. And yeah, yeah. There, there's a way maybe we can do that. I think, yes, sir, I, I agree with the person who's answering this question. Are younger people less dedicated or less attentive to finishing online? My suspicion is probably not really, because when you think of older people and the things that interfere with their lives, that could be as problematic to completing as a younger person who may say, this is not for me. But the younger people have been online since they were age one. So you know, it's a balancing act, but I'm going to give thought to that and see if we can get an answer to it, all right? A good question. Um, and this is, uh, I, so I'm going to share the result of this poll because it looks like, well, we've got 60, give everybody another minute. So far, only 62% voted. 
So that, okay. that's holding strong there. So why don't I close that and share it while um, I tell you one other question. Um, and that is, uh, what if an institution is not eligible for the college ranking sites? And what suggestions do you have to help influence school selection? And Carol, I'd love you to answer that question. I have I have a thought or two on that as well. Gee, I, I really don't know how the ranking system uh, works. I could find out, but Nicole, do you have any idea? Well, I, I don't think know if you're not, <laughs> well, the question is, if you're not ranked, um, what suggestions how do you, get do you have to help? No, yeah. how, how are you influential? How, oh. why would someone choose you, um, even okay. if you're not I can, I can tell you what, you're closer, you have, uh, an, a, a, you're, you're giving $500 scholarships, you're offering seven to eight week courses over the course of a lifetime, the programs you're offering have a rep, good reputation, and all those other factors. Yeah, and mentioned. I also think, I think that's where having a great, recruiting and advising system is that that's going right. to change the landscape because when you have somebody who is reaching out answering questions in a thoughtful and compelling way um, engaging with prospective students kind of on their level that that carries a lot of weight that people want to feel like especially when they're taking online classes that they're not just a number that they right. uh, exactly. that they that they they matter and and that kind of thoughtful support helps that so i won't yeah. I, i'll i'll let you continue but right now we you can see the results so everybody gathers that age and where they live so they weren't worried about that um, but that question of why do you want a degree and why did they choose your university those were two that people were like i wish I wish I knew that. I wish I knew the answer to those. Well, um, you know, we, we stopped asking, why are you going back to school? Why are you going back? Now, that's a different question than why are you going online, but why they're going back to school all falls in their careers. I mean, we, we've got that answer for six years in our in our earlier reports. We didn't ask it again this year because we thought the, the answers were pretty firm over the course of seven years. Yeah. And what was the other part of that, Nicole? No, I I think we answered it. I think we answered okay. it. So, and I know you've got a lot more to cover, so I'll let you continue. Thank okay. you, Carol. Oh, no problem. Okay, moving on. What are their hurdles in enrollment? Um, it comes up over and over again, even in our area of regional studies. Uh, completing those financial aid forms. Wow. So, you know, don't drop them off the phone when you're talking to them asking, when are you going to complete your application? When are you going to complete your application? You say, how can we help you complete your application and really help them? OK, uh, we do, do these lost customer studies where we uh, ask those students who inquired or applied but do not enroll from your institution and what happened to them. And well, first of all, I'm, I'm surprised at the transcript provision. Uh, item was lower as low here because maybe we're getting better at it. But for undergraduates to get their transcripts over to you, my God, that's a huge hurdle. But here, looking at the facts, completing financial aid forms, they need a bit of handholding in that admissions process. You can't leave it all to them. If you want them as a student, help them get over these things. How do I pay? That's all in the financial area. Notice the first two have to do with finances because they tend to be paying for this on their own, even if they're taking out loans, that's their own money. And the tuition reimbursement still stands low, like 10 or 12 or 14 percent overall. I didn't show that data, but it's in the report. Um, so those those are ideas to, to think with. Um, and moving down the scale, I think these are just things you, you probably don't um, need to think about too much. Ah, Here's one. This is what you can share with all your faculty and administrators and board members. What's the value of online learning? And the question was, the, what the option was, my online education was worth a cost. And we only asked those who had participated in online education. Strongly agree, 84%. How's that? Okay. They like what they're getting. That's good data to share with some of your spect uh, people who are uh, a little bit spect suspicious about online learning or whatever. Um, Online learning want a lifelong relationship. What does that mean? What have you done since graduation with that school that you went to online and probably never stepped foot on the campus? 
And number one, do we ever recruit them again? Because some of the largest response was they plan to take classes in the future. Do you keep up with them? Are they on your alumni list? Because not only can they take classes, but look at number two, they can refer students to the school. Are they part of your alumni thinking, keeping in touch, keeping in touch? Um, and I looked down a little bit more. Uh, join the Alumni Association. Do you have, are they able to join your Alumni Association? And look, even 14% donate to the school. And you probably, many of you don't even consider them as potential donors. Here are all things that you can work with your development staff and others to provide them more than what we have been providing them as though they were isolated in some other part of the world. No, they're nearby and they can come over and they can get advice and consultation and they can use those support services. So don't think of them as distant, distant, distance learning probably is not a good terminology and a good terminology anymore. Uh, here are the trends we think you should watch for. Uh, yeah, increasing undergraduate enrollment in STEM and the humanities. Now, the reason why undergraduate and the humanities, you say, well, what are they going to do with an English degree? What are they going to do with a history degree? Because so many now go on to graduate school that they use their undergraduate study to get the humanities uh, focus, and then they do their career-minded um, instruction at the graduate level. So these two still stand out and I see, I don't see as many humanities programs uh, online as probably there should be among, among you all uh, in serving that population. Um, also the increase in males and I think our people in writing this report convinced me that maybe with all the IT and computer-based type programs developing that we will see an increase in males. And I hate to say that more males than not are, are active in that domain. On the other hand, I just learned from Cornell University that 51% of its first year engineering students are female. So we probably, this is something to watch for, may not always be the whole true. And I think we can't deny that we that the potential growth of Hispanics, and if you have Hispanics in your backyard, this is certainly a group to appeal to. So we are ready for another poll, Nicole. And and this is and this is our last one. Um, so we are we are nearing the end of our webinar, and appreciate everyone's time. Uh, but I wanted to ask if anyone ha would like to talk with one of our team members um, and explore what they may need in terms of marketing, in terms of research services with Carol and her team, or contact center. You can go ahead and select that you would like uh, needs analysis, and we can give you a call and talk one on one. Um, but I, I, I'm not going to show those results, but wanted to give people a chance that if they, if you would like a needs analysis and would like to talk with somebody from our team about um, any of these services and the ways in which um, we may be able to help provide some of those differentiating services um, that Carol mentioned in the webinar, we're happy to talk with you. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and close that. Uh, close that poll. Um, some additional resources that so we will be following up with you and sharing this PowerPoint in the next day or so. In addition, um, we encourage you to download our playbook on nurturing post-traditional students, as well as the online college student report, which this webinar is based on. Um, and we'll have links to uh, both of these in the email that we'll be sending as a follow-up. Um, and then as a final note, I want to remind people again, and of course we will have a link to our conference. We've got the Calum conference coming up in Orlando, some fantastic speakers. We will be sharing um, Carol's latest research that she's about to launch. Um, and some of the questions you asked uh, may, be, <laughs> may be included in the research that she does so that we can get a nice robust data, data set that we can share with attendees. We'll also be looking at best practices of advising, recruiting, enrollment management, marketing. Um, we will include a little Disney magic in, in this with um, one of our speakers is talking about really how to enhance um, enhance the experience that students are getting, which I think is important that we think about as a way to differentiate each of our universities and programs. So we hope that you will consider coming to Kalem. So Carol, yes. I will let you wrap us up. 
Okay. Now, Kalem will be great this year. We'll have the new data on 2020 and some, I think, some good and startling information about where are we in this next decade. Um, and also, I want you to know that if you would like the, the presentation we just did, if you want it tailored to your institution, we can do that through Zoom uh, procedures, which we're doing tomorrow with one other institution, and we can tailor it to your needs. And uh, just let me know. Here's the information you may want. Okay, it's been great having you with us. Please call anytime for information, and we're really happy to serve you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great Wednesday. Tuesday. I'm a day ahead of myself. Have a great day. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>